Hello and welcome to How Did This Not Get Made. This is a podcast all about the movies you never saw, the scripts that were never filmed, and the ideas that never even made it to the page. My name is David Spencer. And my name is Daniel Kaka. Da 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 Dan, what whatever could we be talking about this week? We are talking about <laughs> the, I guess, number one superhero of all time. Yeah, I guess maybe we are talking about Superman. All right, we got to go through all of the superheroes. We do. We'll eventually get there. <laughs> Look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Nick Cage. So in the late 90s, we nearly got a cinematic Superman reboot that was written by Kevin Smith to be directed by Tim Burton and starring Nick Cage as the Man of Steel. What a team up. <laughs> the film would have been tied up into the 1989 and 92 Batman and Batman Returns universe and could have potentially launched the Justice League. Now, could this have been the greatest Superman movie ever made? Short answer, yes. Long answer, well, that's the entire podcast. (laughs) Yeah. Now, I know this is something that I'm sure listeners are well aware of the documentary that exists about this story, and I know we'll get into it, but I have never seen the documentary. I know some stuff about the story. Like, I've heard Kevin Smith talk about his experience a little bit. For those of you who don't know, because this is going back a few years now, back in like 96, 97, at one point, I was commissioned by Warner Brothers to write a script for a new Superman movie. And how it came about, I think, was that somebody saw Mallrats, somebody at Warner Brothers, some studio exec, and was just like, watched Brody and and T.S. talk about the kryptonite condom. And they were like, this guy seems to know a lot about Superman. This is going to be a lot of new information for me. I love that with Kevin Smith, whenever he talks about this movie, he says that the money isn't in writing the movie. The money was in talking about the movie later on. (laughs) And he has profusely talked about this movie and his experience with it. Although I will say that his experience with it is very minor to the entire picture of it. Yeah, I think when I first heard about it was from one of the many times he was talking about the story. So in my brain, that was such a big part of the narrative. But even though I don't know the rest of the story, it seems pretty sensible that one writer who was brought on for part of the process probably only has a very small piece of the puzzle. Oh, yeah. I mean, he definitely went through a lot of interesting experiences. And he is a really good speaker when it comes to sharing that story. But I mean, the entire story is fascinating. For sure. But we are not actually going to be starting in the 90s. We are actually going to go back, back, way, way back further, just like what we did with Batman, just like what we did with Spider-Man, because I feel like when it comes to understanding the projection of the movie, I feel like you need to kind of understand the past of the character and where it came from, how it began, how it shaped, and eventually took off. For sure. So let's talk about, well, Superman. So Superman was first conceived by Jerry Siegel and Joel Schuster. They had met while attending Glenville High School in Cleveland, Ohio, back in 1932. Siegel aspired to be a science fiction writer, and Schuster wanted to be an illustrator. Together, they wrote and illustrated articles from the school newspaper. They shared a passion for science fiction, comic strips, and wanted to start making their own comic strips. The two self-published a magazine titled Science Fiction, The Advanced Guard of Future Civilization, and in January of 1933, in which they wrote and illustrated a short story, The Reign of the Superman. That sounds very ominous. (laughs) Now, this 
Superman is actually hyphenated Super Dash Man, mm. which I found very interesting that it seems like most of the <laughs> these origin stories of superheroes always have a dash in it now, <laughs> at least the ones that we run into, and Spider-Man is the only one that kind of kept it. Yeah. You've got the dashes like Spider-Man, the no dash like Batman and Superman. And then you have the extremely rare space like Iron Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Superman is presumed to be an English translation from the philosopher Frederick Nietzsche to describe those who seek a better humanity or the Ubermensch. Yeah. Which he coined in the 1883 book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Favored ideology of fascists as everywhere. Oh, perfect. <laughs> this was a different Superman than we know today. In this, Superman was a bald villain. Hmm. In this, Bill Dunn is tricked by an evil scientist to take an experimental drug that gives him powers of mind reading, mind control, and clairvoyance, using these powers to profit himself and take over the world. The drug eventually wears off, and Bill loses all of his powers. After creating this story, Jerry began to rethink the character and thought that he could be a force for good. So, the influences of Superman came from numerous sources. His strength was pulled from the character Hugo Danner from Philip Wiley's 1930 novel Gladiator and Edgar Rice Burroughs' John Carter of Mars, a character who was much stronger on Mars due to lower gravity. The idea of his alter ego or secret identity came from the Mark of Zorro, which we also saw in Batman. Mm -hmm. The city of Metropolis came from the 1927 film under the same name, that part, I didn't know. I thought that it was just a coincidence that they yeah. were just in the same city, but huh. they actually drew influence from it. The costume was inspired by strongman outfits at the time. Schuster was interested in fitness culture and as a boy was a fan of men like Sigmund Breitbart and Joseph Greenstein, which he used as reference when drawing Superman. Superman originally wore lace-up sandals like many strongmen would wear, hmm. but... That was soon changed to the iconic red boots soon after. The cape was an idea from pulp action heroes who often wore capes and usually was used as a great way to show that the character was in action. The emblem on his chest was inspired by a lot of sports teams that wore logos on their chest, but there was no sports team in particular that I could find that it was based on. So I, I feel like they were just kind of like mm -hmm. making up their own logo. At this point. <laughs> the closest I could find were that some hockey teams would actually put their logo on their chest. Whereas a lot of say like football teams or even baseball teams, it would just be the number on their chest, but it seemed like a lot of hockey teams were adapting the logo on the chest of their Jersey. So you can take that with a grain of salt. I can't confirm it, but that seems <laughs> to be the most common around that time. So the face of Superman, or Clark Kent, was partially modeled from Dick Tracy. Superman was also a bit autobiographical. So he was a journalist because Siegel saw himself becoming one when he left school. But this was later explained so that Superman would be aware of the danger that was around the world. Hmm. You know, I was thinking about the whole Metropolis thing. It's interesting to me that Metropolis is borrowed from that movie, and there is a lot of Batman imagery, specifically Tim Burton's Batman, but I think it's laced in a lot of other Batman lore that pulls from early German expressionist movies like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. It's just kind of interesting to me how... 1920s German cinema has had an influence on American comic book characters. It's definitely one of those movies that has been part of both cinematic history and has kind of been recycled, not just even in comic book movies or imagery, but like it's always come up whenever you show some sort of cityscape where like the city is the character, which is for sure seems so pretentious, but like that idea has always come from and has originated from Metropolis. For sure. So Siegel and Schuster, they spent weeks developing the story and went to newspapers and publications with this groundbreaking and riveting character. And many of them were quick to say no. <laughs> Instead, they were hired by national allied publications and the future would be known as DC Comics. 
to create their new fun comic book series. The idea was to take existing comic strips and flesh them out into full comic book stories. So together, they worked on the musketeer swashbuckler Henry Duval and the supernatural crime fighter Dr. Occult, just to name a few. Now, within National Allied Publications, the collection of comic books called Detective Comics were created in 1937, branching off of what was Action Comics, which debuted Superman for the first time in June of 1983 for just 10 whole cents. (laughs) In January of 1939... Superman began appearing in newspapers, and in October of 1939 was when the first Superman comic book was published. Okay. Now we actually have kind of the idea of Superman from what we know today. Yeah. Superman, it did gain a huge following. At the time, America was on the verge of war, and urbanization became more common as a living situation. Superman was fighting urban crime. He fought for the American worker. There was actually a storyline where he beat up a mine owner for mistreating his employees. Oh, nice! Yeah. (laughs) But he was also meek when it came to his alter ego, Clark Kent, which if you've ever watched any of the movies, you'll notice like he's very like reserved. Mister, just a minute. Now, I realize, of course, that times are tough for some these days, but this isn't the answer. You can't solve uh, society's problems with a gun. <laughs> Compared to him as like Superman. Oftentimes, he was shy and had a hard time talking to women. Again, this would have been autobiographical because Siegel was also awkward around women. (laughs) (laughs) The idea of Superman taking on social issues would then carry with him throughout the years. That's one of the things I think is really interesting when you think about the origins of Superman, especially, you know, in connection to the Ubermensch. The idea of the Superman, of the Nietzschean philosophy, is something that is kind of inherently fascistic and inherently this idea that some people are just better and it ties into this whole like some people just deserve to rule and some people just deserve to be subjugated Mm -hmm. and so it's really interesting that that's where the name superman came from but then he became a symbol of good and altruism how the writers use that name and that idea but to fight against oppressors, whether it's defending workers' rights. I know there's another famous storyline from like the 50s or 60s where they had all of Superman's enemies for a while were real life KKK members. And it led to like a massive drop in people being a part of the KKK because they didn't want to be Superman's bad guys. Oh yeah. And (laughs) it's just so strange to me how these two opposite ideas both use the name Superman. Hmm. But I think it's, you know, the interesting thing that I didn't realize is that, like, the writers were fully aware of this Nietzschean idea of Superman, Mm -hmm. and that's why he was a bad guy when Mm -hmm. the idea was first thought of. It almost feels like a, uh, you know, we're taking this back type of thing of, like, Mm -hmm. people are still drawn to this idea that, like, some people are just inherently better, and people are drawn to that idea. It's almost like they wondered if somebody read their original story and thought the bad guy was actually a good guy, and they were like, okay, no, people want a super powerful person, let's make that super powerful person also be responsible for all these idealistic behaviors. That reminds me of the scene from Friends where Chandler is trying to talk to everyone in the coffee house and no one's paying attention to him and he's like, You've each won a game and I've lost what's felt like a year of my life. <laughs> so everybody goes home a winner. Best out of three? That's what I'm thinking. Should I use my invisibility to fight crime or for evil? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's kind of what happened here was like, well, Superman is great as a villain, but you can't really maintain a main character as a villain, but you can maintain a, a good guy against other bad guys. And I think it was about the sustainability that really pushed the Superman to be good. And I think it's it's also wild when you think about how many twists on the superhero genre there are right now. Like I think about the show The Boys. Yeah. It actually is super duper easy to do a twist on the superhero genre like that, where the mm-hmm. superheroes are the bad guys. So you've got Homelander, who is, you know, the obvious Superman stand-in, who is an awful, awful person. And it is so easy to do that kind of a take because 
it is so easy for that type of person to actually be an awful, terrible person. And it is this idea of the superheroes back to the original root. It's just so interesting to me how that cultural idea contains so much good and so much evil in it and the way like people interpret that in different ways. He's a fascinating character. I saw a meme somewhere out there that showed Superman and underneath it said how America sees themselves. And then it showed a picture of Homelander and it said how the world sees the US. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> makes so much sense. Oh, yeah. But uh, we're talking about <laughs> <laughs> You wanted to go back to the beginning and dive into this. I did. I really did. So Superman was first personified by an actor on July 3rd of 1940 during the New York's World's Fair. On February 12th of 1940 was when The Adventures of Superman radio show premiered with actor Bud Collier as the strange Kryptonian. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman! With, a, with his main catchphrase, this is a job for Superman. The way he says it is just so interesting. This looks like a job for Superman. He would always say, like, this is a job for, and like this high register to show like his meek Clark Kent personality. But then when he said Superman, he would go like really low and powerful. Oh, interesting. Like, this is a job for Superman. <laughs> it's interesting that the way he would put that out there. It was perfect for the role. This changed so much of Superman into what we know today. Superman could now fly. Before that, he could only jump. So if you've heard that Superman could leap over the tallest building. Leap over tall buildings in a single bound. Yeah. I actually have the book called The Physics of Superheroes, which is fascinating. Oh. Like one of the questions I was brought up is like, how many cheeseburgers does the Flash have to eat in order to keep up with his caloric output from running so fast? (laughs) That one's astronomically high, but... There was a problem in there that tried to figure out how big Krypton was. And the way that they could figure it out was they took the tallest building at the time, which was in New York City. They figure if you could leap over that, then you compare that to the average jump height of a human. And then you apply that to Krypton, you could actually figure out the gravitational force of the Earth versus the gravitational force on Krypton. And from that, they could actually estimate how big Krypton actually was. Because on Krypton, he's just as strong there as we are on Earth. In this case, they decided that now Superman can fly. So it wasn't until the radio show. So not even in the comic books at that point did they show him flying yet. The Daily Star was then turned to the Daily Planet, and the chief editor was now named Perry White instead of George Taylor. Also, Jimmy Olsen became a key main character. Oh, was Jimmy Olsen created in the radio show? Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff was created in the radio show versus... I guess I'm not surprised at like some ideas and catchphrases, but that's kind of interesting that Jimmy Olsen is for Superman than what Harley Quinn is for Batman of being a character created in a show. The sense that Harley Quinn was created in the animated series, as opposed to being created in the comics, you know, Jimmy Olsen created for the radio show instead of being created in the comics. I will say that the biggest change that was introduced was kryptonite and that didn't come until 1943 Mm. it was introduced because collier was unavailable for a few weeks and they had to explain why superman sounded like a different person (laughs) (laughs) yeah so the idea was like if he was sick or if he was gone on vacation they brought in a different actor to portray superman clark is something wrong Wrong? No, no, nothing's wrong. Well, I, I've never seen you this way before. And usually he would sound really weak compared to his Superman alternative. And the idea was like, oh, he's been hit with kryptonite and he's just unavailable. I'm shocked that they couldn't just find a decent voice double. No, it does tend to lend an interesting factor to giving Superman a weakness with kryptonite. So the radio show really shaped a lot of what Superman as we know it today. 
Kryptonite wasn't used in the comic books, not until Superman number 61, which was released in December of 1949. So about 10 years later, Kryptonite wasn't used in the comic books. In 1942, though, is when Superman first hit the silver screen in 17 animated shorts produced by Flesher Studios. Up in the sky! Look! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! The same studios that made Betty Boop and Popeye, and was distributed by Paramount Pictures. They also used the same voice actors from the radio show. I know with Warner Brothers, when they created Looney Tunes, Looney Tunes weren't actually made for television. They were actually made as shorts that you would watch as a part of the movie. And this is how Superman was presented. It was actually presented as part of a movie feature because when you go to movies like it was kind of like an event that you would go to like you'd watch the news reels you would watch shorts animated shorts you'd watch the actual movie and then after the movie was done then you would actually see previews for other movies but they actually called them trailers because they trailed the end of the movie and that's where we get that term from so in the comic books, though, Superman was shown to be beating up controversial world leaders at the time during World War II, like Hitler, mm-hmm. the Japanese general Hideki Tojo, and Mussolini. He also encouraged people to buy war bonds. <laughs> <laughs> Like every animated character of the time. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like with Disney when they were asked by the government to uh, use Donald Duck to help people buy war bonds, pay their taxes. Yeah. Invest in war saving certificates today. Oh, man. Yes, you. What would you be worth if the United Nations lost this war? Nothing. We must win. Enlist in our army of regular war savers today. Great stuff. Did you know that Donald Duck is also a honorary Navy? Yeah, he's an honorary member of the Navy. Mm-hmm. I always thought that was fascinating. I wonder if they have those on Disney Plus. The uh, oh. the Donald Duck World War II propaganda films. Ooh. That would be really fascinating. That would be great. I have to look into that. So the first time we see Superman in live action was actually in 1948, simply titled Superman. Krypton was a rugged planet laced with jagged mountain chains, rich in strange minerals unknown to Earth. And on a wide plateau lay the capital of Krypton, the nerve center of a civilization that was far advanced, for it boasted a race of super men and women. With Kirk Allen, who also appeared in the 1950 sequel, Adam Man vs. Superman. You can't defy the world and get away with it, Luthor. In Adam Man vs. Superman, that's when we are first introduced to the villain Luther, a mad scientist who has threatened the world with atom bombs. The flight sequences in these films were actually all rotoscoped. For most audiences, this was actually a disappointment because... The idea of seeing a live-action Superman was that you actually got to see someone in live-action fly. Yeah. It's so weird. Like, if you ever see the any of the animated shorts, it kind of looks like they took that Superman and then just kind of, like, rotoscoped over him, and then he flew away that way. It's kind of bizarre. But we do get an introduction to Luther, and this is kind of where things get to eventually get to to Lux Luther, but we'll explain that later. Hmm. In 1951, we got a cinematic reboot with Superman and the Mole Men, starring George Reeves. You don't know anything about these creatures, what they are or where they've come from, but here's the man that can tell you. Go on, Corrigan. They came up out of the drill shaft in the oil well from six miles underground. (laughs) They look strange to us, it's true. We must look just as strange to them, but as far as we know, they don't mean us any harm. This would launch the TV series The Adventures of Superman, starring the same actors from the film. Yes, it's Superman, a strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities. of 104 episodes as much as everyone adored reeves as superman he was not happy with this role the reason is because filming was grueling on the actor 
having to take up to a year off in between episodes because production was so slow. He found the costume humiliating. The stunts he had to perform were too dangerous. In one instance, the wire had snapped, which caused him to crash to the ground. And he found it difficult to find roles outside of being the Man of Steel. For example, there was an episode of I Love Lucy, but he was there as Superman. Of all the crazy things that you've done in the 15 years, I've been married for 15 years. Yeah, 15 years. And they call me Superman. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. He then became a heavy drinker and unfortunately died by suicide on June 16th of 1959. Wait, I thought that was where there was like a big story of like a a suspected murder or something like that. Am I thinking of something different? Yeah, there was suspicion of murder, partly because the idea of Superman dying by suicide was just such an odd thought. Like thinking that This character who could ricochet bullets eventually would kill him. And this character who's supposed to represent, you know, the best of us. Yeah. It really rattled the cage of, like, who Superman is in the U.S. And the idea of then revamping Superman just seemed unlikely. From there, like, they tried going alternative routes instead of just going with straight Superman. There was an unaired pilot that was called Super Pup. Faster than the speediest jet, more powerful than the mightiest rocket, able to fly around the world faster than you can say Super Pup. And only you and I know that Super Pup is really Bart Bent, star reporter for the Daily Bugle. This is so weird. It was a show that used little people. Okay. And they put like these big puppet heads oh geez dog heads on them you can see clips of it online but the show was never aired (laughs) also there was superboy the adventures of superboy incredible boy of steel powerful fearless invulnerable only survivor of the doomed planet krypton that didn't go anywhere either it just wasn't working so like after that it was like it's just devastating like how do you bounce back yeah for sure from that Now, in the comics, DC was publishing seven different titles and storylines that featured Superman. Adventure Comics, World's Finest, and Action Comics, where Superman could team up with other DC heroes like Batman, Supergirl, The Flash, Wonder Woman, and more. There were contained Superman universe titles like Superman, there was also Superboy, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane. So there was a lot of Superman going on (laughs) around this time as far as comic books go. And the ideas coming out of the comics were insane. There was multicolored kryptonite. He had a mermaid girlfriend for a little bit. There was Beepo, the super monkey, Comet, the super horse, Crypto, the super dog. And there was a storyline where Superman blew out a star like a candle. (laughs) Superman seemed to be beyond powerful. And the comic book writers found it difficult to find villains that could match his strength. I mean, yeah, if you can do almost anything, like, how do you do? How do you defeat him? So they would often turn to a lot of emotional drama and ask the questions like, could he love? Could he be married? And this always baffles me. And I know Kevin Smith touches kind of on this in Mallrats, but could he have kids? Could he kid? Would that work? I don't know. More efforts were put into the live action world. And in 1966, there was It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's Superman, the musical. Come on, let's go. I need a little exercise. Take that. Let's see what you can do. You boys are good. With Bob Holiday as Superman and directed by Harold Prince. 
This spawned the 1975 TV special under the same name starring David Wilson, and it was not well received. (laughs) (laughs) Even the Superman comics weren't doing too well. DC hired editor Julius Schwartz to try and revamp the hero, updating him, making him into a TV reporter. But readers seemed to be losing interest in the man that seemed more powerful than God. Not even the cartoon Super Friends could help. It looked like Superman was about to receive his last dose of kryptonite. Uh, But lurking underneath, in 1973, there was producer Isla Sokland, who convinced his father, Alexander Sokland, to purchase the rights for Superman. After a long process trying to obtain the rights, DC agreed to let them purchase the property alongside with partner Pierce Spengler. Right away, the Sulklands were looking to make a big swing. To write the script, they considered William Goldman, who had done Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, All the President's Men, and The Princess Bride. There was Leigh Brackett, who had done The Big Sleep, Rio Bravo, The Long Goodbye, and there was an early draft of The Empire Strikes Back that he wrote. Yep. There's Alfred Bester, who wrote the science fiction classic, The Demolished Man. He was hired on for a bit, and he actually wrote a treatment, but they eventually settled on Mario Puzo. Do you know who Mario Puzo is? I do not. He wrote The Godfather. Oh, okay. And with the help of David Newman, Leslie Newman, and Robert Benton. Now, the directors that were considered were Francis Ford Coppola. Like I said, they're swinging big for this movie. For sure. There's William Frederick, Richard Lester, Peter Yates, John Gillerman, Ronald Deem, George Lucas was also considered, but he was in the middle of doing a little movie called Star Wars. I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, <laughs> Steven Spielberg, I thought was really interesting, was actually considered, but they considered him too inexperienced as a director to actually take this on. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, he's got the idealism that would be a perfect Mm -hmm. fit. Yeah. (laughs) And then there was Sam Pickenpaw, which I thought was interesting. Pickenpaw was actually dropped because during one of the meetings, he pulled out a gun. (laughs) I tried looking more into the story because this is insane. He just pulled out a gun. Like, was he offended or something? Or is like, I'm going to have it my way or the highway or something? The closest I could find was there was an article that read, I believe that this was aimed towards Ilya Salkland. He was the one who convinced his father to purchase rights for it. But Pick and Paul was quoted saying, you got to shut up, kid. What do you think you know about movies? That was it. That's all I could find. It just moved on. <laughs> And it's just insane to me that, like, this meeting happened and it's not talked about more. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and then after producer Mark Robson saw The Omen, he knew that Richard Donner had to be the director. After Donner was hired, he felt the script was too campy and thought it should be more straightforward. So he hired Tom Mechwitz, who wrote 007, to polish and tone down the story. That's really interesting because superhero things were all camp prior to this and that's a really yeah really smart move on his part i mean in hindsight it's especially smart move because i feel like this live action superman is kind of a major turning point in the way that superhero stories are seen in a cultural context yeah it seemed like with superheroes like that's a thing for kids comic books are a thing for children young little boys And they're approaching this as if this is going to be an Oscar-nominated movie. And you got to think, like, the power of nostalgia. There's a lot of kids who grew up with Superman who are now adults and want to see a realistic take. I mean, it's definitely not the same definition of quote-unquote realistic superhero story that when somebody says that term today, what they mean. But I know one of the big marketing pushes for this was, you'll believe a man can fly. This year, Superman brings you the gift of flight. That idea, I think, was used in commercials and trailers, and like it was a big part of the marketing of this movie, and I feel like that's in direct response to what you were saying about the 50s Superman thing, where they were rotoscoping the flying, and that this was a time where it's like, people want to see Superman like they've never seen it before, and that means somebody taking Superman seriously. It's like the idea that Tim Burton had brought up with Batman, thinking realistically, what brings a person to dress up and fight crime? What brings them to that point? And I think 
this in a way is like, how is Superman brought to this point and how do you take on more real life conflicts and infuse that into a superhero? And they, they did it pretty well. So DC, they did have a list of actors that they wanted to portray Superman. That list included Muhammad Ali. Oh, interesting. interesting. Al Pacino, James Caan, Steve McQueen, Clint Eastwood, and Dustin Hoffman. Wow. Every single one of those actors is very different and would bring something totally different to the page. That's so strange. For Muhammad Ali to be Superman, that would have been fascinating to like- Absolutely. Right off the bat, let's have a black Superman. That would have yeah. been very interesting. Yeah. That would have been game changing, especially like people still get all tangled up in a knot when a a character who is white in the comics gets cast as a different race. People get upset about that now. That would have been fascinating to know how culture would have been different if that happened from the first superhero movie. And I wonder if that would really change our mind as to when we perceive someone portraying either a superhero or someone like a character like 007 and considering Edris Elba to be 007 in the backlash that happened saying that like 007's not black. He's not supposed to be black. That's not supposed to happen. But mm-hmm. maybe had Muhammad Ali been Superman in the 70s, that might be changing our perception of like who can actually play and portray these characters it doesn't have to exactly mirror what's going in the comics yeah absolutely well especially you know when you consider most of those superhero characters when they were created race was not a thing they were thinking about it was probably just white artists and writers who were drawing white faces because that's what seemed the quote-unquote norm for them and I think about characters who get cast as a different race other than they're drawn as. And any minority character, any minority hero, you can't cast as a different race because their race is a part of the character. You know, Luke Cage has to be black. That is part of his character. Black Panther, obviously. Whereas superheroes who are mostly white, the only one I can think of that I don't think you could recast as a different race is Daredevil, only because being Irish Catholic is such a part of his identity. And so I feel like you need an Irish Catholic Daredevil. But for every other character, it's just... That happened to be, you know, whatever the stock I- image in their mind was. And considering that Superman is an alien. Yeah. And for him to look different from everyone else. Oh, man, this would have been. Absolutely. Fantastic if they went this direction. People always talk about how Superman is an immigrant story as well. You know, to have a non-white face, that would have been really, really interesting. Yeah. Another side note tangent, I was reading a thing online the other day about the idea of Black Lex Luthor in, I think, one of the 90s animated series or something. Because of the way Lex Luthor was drawn, he resembles more of a light-skinned black man than a white person just because of like the way his jawline is structured and his facial features are structured. And so because of that, a lot of people kind of saw this as Black Lex Luthor. And since then, there have now been other interpretations of Lex Luthor as a black character. The Harley Quinn show, for example, has Giancarlo Esposito. Is that his name? The guy who plays Gus Fring in Breaking Bad, but he voices Lex Luthor and it is a black Lex Luthor in that show that's fascinating so (laughs) this is a lot of a-list celebrities but the producers didn't really want that because they already had a big name writer they had a big name director i mean it it seems like they should have gone with an a-list celebrity with like all these big names attached to it but they didn't want to really go with that direction robert redford he was offered the role but he felt that he was too famous for the role which i thought was interesting burt reynolds also turned down the role i hear these names and now i'm just imagining superman with a mustache (laughs) (gasps) it would have been great if he had like like a fake mustache when he was clark kent and then he took it (laughs) off (laughs) that's perfect Mm -hmm. sylvester stallone was really interested in the role but that did not happen They didn't consider Dustin Hoffman anymore for Superman. They considered him for Lex Luthor, though. But Dustin Hoffman turned down that role. Oh, that would have been really interesting. Although he did end up playing one of the most perfect villains in Hook. 
So oh yeah, I'll say we <laughs> we got him there. Paul Newman was offered in the major three roles, but he eventually turned all three of those down, which was, I believe, Superman, Lex Luthor, and Perry White, I think, were the major. Oh, I was like, major three? They offered Lois Lane to him? <laughs> that's, I mean, as long as we're talking about interesting takes, that's definitely an interesting take. Paul Newman is a chameleon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on board for gay Superman. Oh, man. <laughs> him and Jimmy Olsen. I think the age difference there makes it a little creepy. I mean, you could always lower the age of Superman, bring up... That's yeah. true. Like they did in Smallville, yeah. where they're basically the same age. Yeah, you can play around with that for sure. Casting seems so tricky because, on one hand, Superman is such an iconic character, but on the other hand, Superman was a property that seemed to be on its last leg. Now, the chance of failure was greater than success. Other actors involved were Neil Diamond and Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> who really wanted the role, but they were turned down. James Cann, Josh Brolin, Lyle Wagner, Christopher Walken, Nick Nolte, John Vault, and Perry King were asked, but they all denied the role. Chris Christopherson and Charles Bronson were also considered. That didn't happen. Is there anybody who wasn't considered for Superman? <laughs> Patrick Wayne was casted as Superman, but he dropped the role when his father, John Wayne, was diagnosed with cancer. So the producers decided that maybe they would go for an unknown actor. And they actually uh, put out an audition for Superman. And one of the people that auditioned for Superman was Bruce Jenner. Oh, interesting. But over 200 actors had auditioned for this role. It does come down to Christopher Reeves. And when he came in, it wasn't like it was love at first sight. In fact, Donner thought he was too young. He was too skinny. But at the screen test... Reeves amazed Donner, but told Reeves that he needed a muscle suit in order for him to look stronger. Now, Reeves was not a fan of the idea of putting on a muscle suit, and in the time leading up to the shoot, he managed to pack on 30 pounds of muscle, which made him perfect for the role. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. 30 pounds of muscle. That's insane. This was the spinach that Superman needed to give the characters comeback. Easy, miss. I've got you. you. You've got me! Who's got you? The movie, which came out in 1978, it made $305 million in the box office, and then the sequel in 1982... Three super villains. <laughs> or four, if you count him twice. The adventure continues in Paris. <gasps> which was directed by Richard Lester, who we know from directing a bunch of Beatles movies. That ended up making $190.4 million. Lester continued with the franchise and directed the third Superman movie in 1984. Superman 3. This time, Richard Pryor has come to Metropolis. Now wanting to make it more campy, it was not well received by audiences and only brought in about $100 million in the box office. So, I don't know if you know anything about the third Superman movie. I know a little bit about some of the, the craziness that happened to Superman after that first one. Yeah, that's the one with Richard Pryor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I believe that's also the same plot as Office Space. What am I supposed to do with half a cent by a third red mouse? You mean everybody loses those fractions? Well, they don't exactly lose them. You can't lose what you never got. Then what happens to all those half cents? The company gets it? No, not really. They can't be bothered to collect a half cent from your paycheck any more than you could. Then what happens to them? Well, they're just floating around out there. The computer's nowhere. Every time there's a bank transaction where interest is computed, and there are thousands a day, the computer ends up with these fractions of a cent, which it usually rounds off. But what this does is it takes those little remainders and puts it into account. The intention that Ali S. Hawken had for the franchise was to make a Superman trilogy then Supergirl, and then launch a TV series. But yeah. in 1984, when Supergirl premiered, it tanked in the box office and only earned $14.3 million. Enjoy your prison, Supergirl, forever and ever. Yet again, Superman was on the downswing. The Salklins wanted to give up the franchise and decided to let Canon Films to produce Superman 4 in 1987. I'm going to do what our governments have been unwilling or unable to do. Effective immediately, I'm going to rid our planet of all nuclear weapons. 
this is the one where Superman achieves world peace. It's a ridiculous plot line. And it was definitely one of the cheapest Supermans that were ever built. Which, if you know anything about canon films, they're known for going ridiculous, cheap, and whatever gets people into the seats. Christopher Reeves did remain in the cast. The film was cheaply made at $17 million. And as is canon's business model, compared to the first film, which was $55 million. So huge, huge difference. And it just, it looks terrible. The effects for it in 1987 look far worse than when it came out in 1978. This would be the final time that Reeves would appear on screen as Superman. The Selklands still maintained the rights to Superman, even though they had no plans after the franchise had done so poorly in the end. In 1986, so we're going back to the comic books now. So in 1986, Schwartz retired from DC Comics and was followed by Mike Carlin, who hired John Byrne to scrap all the old Superman lore and decided to start over and reimagine the hero. He made Superman look more muscular. So that's when you get like those defined muscles was in the 80s. Oh, yeah. But he had also turned down his abilities to give the Man of Steel more reasonable opponents in conflicts. So the major change that we saw was in the character Lex Luthor. But making him a billionaire industrialist instead of a mad scientist, capitalism was on the rise in the 80s. And Byrne found a way to villainize someone that could use his wealth to his advantage. When Byrne left DC, sales went down and most comic book fans were going mad for Batman instead. Batman had become DC's biggest superheroes, not just with the comics like with Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns in year one, but in the box office as well with Tim Burton's Batman. You're having an image problem. Don't be ridiculous. I'm Superman. Yeah, exactly. You're fucking white bread. You're boring. Look at you in your stupid outfit. So in the comic books, with Batman overshadowing Superman, they had to do something to make a splash. After 50 years, Clark Kent finally reveals himself to Lois Lane and tells him the truth that he is indeed Superman. I'm Superman. <laughs> oh, that's, that's good, Clark. You got me. Look at me. Oh my god. Also, they got engaged to be married. This gained a lot of readers, but unintendedly, they gained a lot of female fans. Before the fans could see Lois and Clark tie the knot, in issue 75, the unthinkable happened. Superman was killed by the villain Doomsday. Man of Steel has proven to be as vulnerable as the mere mortals who've looked up to him for more than half a century. Superman died Wednesday. This issue alone sold over six million copies and became the top selling comic in 1992. And most comic book stores in Orange County are already sold out of Superman's 75th edition. A second printing is due out next week. So for the issues after that, they actually continued on with the Superman comic books, but without Superman, which is interesting. Mm, but they were yeah. showing like everyone mourning, but also kind of like a rise in crime villains coming out of the woodwork because Superman was dead. Now, there was a plan to bring him back to life, and there were four Supermen that emerged that claimed to be the real Superman. So all the comic book writers... And artists came together to figure out how Superman was going to come back from the dead. And they came up with four different stories. Mm -hmm. And they ended up using all of them. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> there were four Supermen that emerged claiming to be the real Superman. There was Steel, the Cyborg Superman, Superboy, and the Eradicator. Okay. So it turns out all four of these Supermen were not actually Superman. But instead, the Eradicator, he had stolen Superman's body and put it into a regeneration matrix at the Fortress of Solitude. Ah. So when Superman came back to life, he was lacking his powers that would slowly return back to them, and he donned a black version of a suit, also 
he had long hair. <laughs> fascinating. Very Spider-Man yeah. 3. We see this in the 90s, but this has kind of become an iconic Superman suit. And we see this now with like the Snyderverse. With the Snyder Cut coming out, we are going to see Superman again, I guess, in a black suit. But we've... Oh, really? Yeah. But we, we've seen him like this before in a few countries. Well, Smallville had something similar to that. Did they? I never actually watched Smallville. I should really watch it now. <laughs> Superman looked like he was back on the upswing with Lois and Clark, the new adventures of Superman. It looked like he was gaining back popularity. The show took a much different approach to the character in which the show focused more on Clark Kent and his journey into becoming Superman rather than Superman the hero and his alter ego as a connecting story to go from villain to villain. And in 1993, WB purchased the rights for a Superman movie from the Salklands and made the announcement that there would be a new Superman film in the works. And WB turned to producer John Peters, due to his success with Batman, to launch the new era of the cinematic Superman. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about John Peters. <laughs> Who is he? So, John Peters, he first experienced the film industry when he was only 11 years old when he was an extra in the film The Ten Commandments, where he actually played one of the liberated Jews. He was so enthralled by the filmmaking process that he actually refused to wash off his makeup when he came home from set. And he knew that this is what he wanted to be a part of for the rest of his life. Growing up, he worked at his mother's family hair salon on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills to make a living. There, he designed a wig for Barbara Streisand when she got cast in the 1974 comedy For Pete's Sake. The two formed a relationship. Streisand thought that his talents could be used elsewhere rather than in the salon and had him produce her studio album, Butterfly, and would later have him be the producer for her next film, A Star is Born, in 1976. Hmm. Over the years, Peter has been known for his reclusive behavior. While in pre-production of A Star is Born, he suggested that he should be the director and the star of the film. Hmm. Who else do we know as a star and director of A Star is Born? <laughs> <laughs> And there were multiple accounts of his quick temper around Streisand. The fact that he still has a career in the film industry baffles me. <laughs> he was even the producer for the newest A Star is Born. So, when Peters was assigned to produce, he immediately hired script doctor Jonathan Lemkin to write the script. Prior, he had written a handful of episodes of 21 Jump Street, Beverly Hills 90210, Hill Street Blues, and he helped revise the script for Demolition Man. With the pressure of WB, Peters and major toy companies on Lemkin's back, he knew that he had to make a great Superman story. So he used the recently successful The Death of Superman, World Without Superman, and Superman Reborn as a launching point for his story. His story would immediately kill off Superman, and Lois would discover soon after she was pregnant with their son. Their son would grow and mature much faster than any human, and when he matured, that's when he would begin his superhero adventure. Sprinkled into the script were some Burton-like elements, and to try and tie into the newly created DC Universe. Keep in mind, he had not been attached to this project at this time. WB was not happy with the script and felt the tone and style were too similar to Batman Returns. Hmm. It's not a bad pitch. I'm curious what in the tone was being too derivative, because I feel like you can definitely take that log line and make something really unique out of it. Yeah, I think you can do something interesting with it, although... When you go and see a Superman movie, you kind of expect it to be Clark Kent. And especially if you're rebooting it, like you want it to be Clark Kent, not son of Clark Kent. Yeah, but this is also not even 10 years after the last Superman movie. Yeah, I can see why that script is questionable. So next up to take on Superman was writer Gregory Poirier, who had recently worked as a writer for Peters on the movie Rosewood. He turned in his draft in December of 1995. 
His draft matched the same dark tone as Lemkin's script. He focused more on Kalel's existential crisis that he was an alien on Earth and what it means to him. He also introduced the villain Brainiac, an extraterrestrial cyborg who builds Doomsday, a monster with kryptonite for blood. Doomsday kills Superman. Another alien, Cradmus, then resurrects Kal-El from the dead. The reborn Superman is alive without powers, so he dons himself into a robot armor so that he can keep fighting his enemies until his powers come back. And then using the mental discipline known as Finyar is what brought back his powers. Weird. Weird. I like the idea of Superman having to relearn his powers and being powerless for a time, but I don't like him making a robot suit to make up for it. Yeah, because I feel like you're not learning anything because you're just immediately giving him his powers again. Lastly, by Peter's request, when Superman is fully capable of his previous abilities, he dons a black outfit rather than the common red and blue suit from before. They're really obsessed with this black outfit, although black suited Superman does seem really interesting. Yeah. WB was a fan of the script until they met up with Kevin Smith, who is in the process of making Chasing Amy, and he was asked to rewrite multiple scripts, including the sequel to Beetlejuice. Because Chasing Amy was about two comic book creators and his Superman monologue in Mallrats, WB saw him as a true comic book fan and asked what he thought about the script. This will definitely, you know, score a lot of points for the comic book fanboys if we have Kevin Smith writing our movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm sure that name cred mattered more to them than Kevin Smith's actual opinions. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Having a comic book movie Kevin Smith approved? Yeah. That's definitely going to make millions in the For sure. opening weekend. So in an Entertainment Weekly interview, Kevin Smith had said, I said I thought it was terrible. Poirier didn't get the Superman mythos. So WB was terrified <laughs> that his thoughts would persuade fans away from the movie, especially with Kevin Smith, who is a proclaimed voice in the comic book nerd community, also (laughs) owns a comic book store still to this day. It was formerly known as Comicology, which is now known as Jay and Silent Bob's Secret Stash. Mm -hmm. So WB seized the opportunity and hired Smith to rewrite Superman under certain parameters. Superman had to die. Brainiac is their featured villain. Okay. And he has to go talk to John Peters. <laughs> <laughs> Peters then added his ridiculous demands. One, I don't want to see him in that suit. Two, I don't want to see him fly. And three, he's got to fight a giant spider in the third act. <laughs> Regardless, Smith went on to write the script knowing that this would not be the version of the Superman that he had envisioned. But rather, it was giving all the ingredients, and he was there just to kind of make it all work somehow. Mm -hmm. And you can actually read Kevin Smith's script of Superman online if you absolutely want to. It is... It's interesting, for sure. If I'm not mistaken, I could be totally off base with this, but I feel like I remember in one of the many times he was telling stories of meeting this guy, he also had in his office a poster of Superman versus Muhammad Ali, which is kind of a famous comic art. You can search for Superman versus Muhammad Ali, which also... Goes back to that original casting, which is so interesting. Fascinating. I did not know that. I could be totally off base with that, but I feel like I remember hearing that in a story somewhere. It seems like something he would do. (laughs) (laughs) Before WB wanted to proceed with the full script, they first wanted a treatment just so they can get an idea of the story before moving on to the actual script. Smith did submit a summary, which included some dialogue he wanted to include, and ended up submitting a 80-page long treatment. That's a half a movie script Oops. there, Kevin Smith. Pretty much. Like, he basically gave them the equivalent of James Cameron yeah. doing a scriptment. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. If you know so much of this character so much about him and you're just like if you understand the mythos behind it and you're just like yeah they have to get it right they absolutely do and then we all know how much kevin smith can ramble so (laughs) it's no surprise that he would submit something like an 80 page 
a script mint. And that just gives more fuel to the producers to be like, he knows exactly what he's doing. I don't think you see that as much of a bad thing, other than maybe they had to read 76 more pages than they're used to. <laughs> In his version, Brainiac is a energy sucking alien and his robot Elron, who is based on Elron Hubbard, <laughs> is contacted by Lex Luthor and is asked for their assistance to help get rid of Superman. Since Superman gains his strength and powers from the sun, Brainiac and Luthor find a way to block the sun and diminish Superman's powers, leaving him vulnerable for Doomsday to defeat him. In this timeline, Lois already knows Superman's alter ego, Clark Kent. He put in cameos for Batman and Deadshot, which I thought was fascinating. Deadshot makes an appearance as like one of the villains. Batman was brought in because after Superman dies, he's actually at the funeral and is one of the speakers at the funeral. He also included Perry White and Jimmy Olsen from the Daily Planet. When it came to Superman's look, he never actually describes the suit. He just says, it's a 90s style suit, <laughs> just so he doesn't have to say it's a black suit or it's a red and blue suit. <laughs> he also tried to write around the fact that Superman doesn't fly as to Peter's demands, I guess. But the way that he wrote around it was that he would leap up and... And then while in the air, he would be followed by a sonic boom. Oh, interesting. So he never actually used the word fly, but he said leap and boom. Yeah. Just to kind of imply that he would whoosh away. I mean, I'm sure they've they've done flight this way and other things, but the show Heroes, that's how they did when Nathan Petrelli flies. He leaps up in the air and then sonic boom somewhere else. Huh. Interesting. For the most part, Peters was pleased with the script, but insisted that it included more action scenes. The examples that he gave and that Smith has openly talked about was that Brainiac would go to the Fortress of Solitude to find Superman and would have to fight off his guards, in which Kevin Smith replied, why would Superman need guards? It's called the Fortress of Solitude for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> he also suggested that Brainiac fight only one polar bear. What? <laughs> While he was up there. So there's a scene where Brainiac, he actually gets in a fight with two polar bears, but ends up defeating one of them. <sighs> and Peter's reasoning behind this is that if you only kill one, it won't piss off the PETA people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get having to add more action into a script but this is just kind of silly action for yeah this is silly it's action for actions there's it's not necessary for that to happen smith began working on the script titled superman lives while working on the script smith was consistently bombarded with calls from producers and executives but not from wb but from peter's production company so he was quoted in the press that they were, quote, a group of anxious motherfuckers, which was misquoted and made WB look bad when it was really Peters and his production that was really riding him the entire time. Yeah. Smith was really irritated with Peters and his company because there were days where he could get up to four calls in just one day asking about his progress. And then finally, on March 27th of 1997, Kevin Smith delivered his draft of the much-anticipated Superman Lives. So Smith thought that his job was done, but he was then asked to actually go back to John Peter's house for a meeting. Smith assumed that he had read the script and he just wanted to describe any changes, but nope. Instead, John wanted him to read the script out loud to him. While Peters actually laid down on his couch, looked up at the ceiling, and just kind of imagined the movie projecting on the ceiling. He actually <laughs> did the director's square thing that you do with your fingers. Like, he did that oh gosh. in front of his face while Kevin Smith, <laughs> he <laughs> read the whole thing to him. So silly. It is. Uh, they said, second off, you can't leave. You got to stick around here and read John the outline. <laughs> And I said, what, what do you mean, read John the outline? They said, yeah, he likes to have the outlines read to him by the writer. I said, what do I have, fucking talk him in when I'm done, too? The argument from Peters is that he doesn't really get 
the energy of the movie just by reading it, but he wants to be able to experience it. And who better to know the material than the writer and have that reading out loud to him? Again, how Peters is still a producer baffles me to this day. <laughs> the first director who was asked to make this film, which is actually one of my personal favorites, Robert Rodriguez mm. was asked to do Superman. Got Kevin Smith and Robert Rodriguez on a big studio superhero movie? Yeah. It is wild. Oh, man. I love Robert Rodriguez, most of the stuff that he does. And he would have been very interesting Yeah, to put this all together. He had read the script. He really liked it. But at the time, he had just wrapped From Dust Till Dawn had plans to move back to Texas. He also just had his first child. He had published his book, Rebel Without a Crew, and was in the middle of premiering Desperado. So I would say at this time, he was just a little busy (laughs) doing some stuff. And as much as he liked the script and knew that it would be a big blockbuster hit for him, he did turn it down and instead went on to make The Faculty. Next up was... Tim Burton. Now we're really getting into the meat of things because mm-hmm. he launched Batman with Peters with much success. So, but WB was wary about having him direct since he had just released Mars Attacks, which proved to be a big flop. But this could also potentially be his comeback. The actor that came up a lot and the producers were in favor was Nick Cage who had done The Rock, Con Air, and won an Academy Award for Leaving Las Vegas. We mustn't kick the bar, we lean into the bar. Just just lean into the railing. Because it's not vino veritas, it's en vino veritas. Who the fuck are you talking to? Whenever I bring up Nicolas Cage being Superman and so many people just wondering why, thinking that this would just be a ridiculous person to play superman well the thing that interests me it sounds like the studio wanted nicholas cage when i would have assumed it was the other way around that it was nicholas cage gunning for this role and he kind of was in a way cage is an outspoken comic book fan and had recently turned down the role of Tony Stark for an Iron Man movie that was in development. That would have been so interesting. I am here for Nicolas Cage's Tony Stark. That's interesting. That'll be something that we explore later. (laughs) We'll put a pin in that for now. Okay. Now, there was obvious backlash for the casting, but Burton defended his decision by saying, that's what they said about Michael Keaton and Batman. Even Kevin Smith defended the choices, saying that his performance would have been tremendous. Hmm. Is this before or after he named his son Kal-El? This is before he okay. named his son Kal-El. But after he had taken the name Cage from Luke Cage to be his stage name. Yes. It felt like it was in the cards for him to eventually become a superhero, which, I mean, he did become Ghost Rider. He became Ghost Rider, and he was Spider-Man Noir. Yeah. (laughs) But in line for Lex Luthor was the Oscar winner, Kevin Spacey. (laughs) Mm. Wait, had he won an Oscar already at this point? What year are we in again? We are in 97. So what, would this have been like right after the movie Seven? Oh, The Usual Suspects and Seven. Oh, of course. And LA Confidential. Of course. I always forget about the usual suspects. Yeah, Lex Luthor was going to go to Kevin Spacey. For Brainiac, WB looked for a more comedic style and actually considered Jim Carrey, while Burton wanted Christopher Walken or Chris Rock for Jimmy Olsen. Hmm. Yeah, which Chris Rock would have been fascinating. Yeah. This is the time where Kevin Smith was also working on Dogma as well. Oh, yeah. Chris Rock was actually on set... And he actually asks uh, Kevin Smith, he's like, guess who's up for Jimmy Olsen? And he's like, is it you? He's, and like Chris Rock was a little offended by that. And he's like, yeah, it's it's me. He's <laughs> like, oh, man, no, no, no. That's awesome. That's great that you're going to be Jimmy Olsen. Which, I mean. No, he would have been a great job. Chris Rock as Jimmy Olsen would have been awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. For Lois Lane, they were considering Sandra Bullock. Julian Moore, and Courtney Cox. Those were the three at the top of the list. I could definitely see any of them, you know, doing a good job. Yeah. 
I think Julian Moore would be a really interesting Lois Lane. Yeah. Although Sandra Bullock just... I don't know. Anyone Sandra Bullock, things. especially that era of Sandra Bullock, mm-hmm. feels like spot on. I feel like she would have brought in some spunk like that Aaron Brockovich spunk into Lois Lane. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like that's always been part of Lois Lane's character as well. I mean, she's supposed to be a snappy reporter. I mean, so much of Lois Lane and Clark Kent's banter is based off of His Girl Friday and that sort of thing. Sandra Bullock would have absolutely been able to do that. So the project was greenlit, obviously. Both Burton and Cage signed a pay or play deal, meaning that whether the movie was made or not, Burton would be paid $5 million, and Nick Cage was paid a whopping $20 million, Wow! whether or not he would have been Superman or not. He's going to pay for a lot of dinosaur bones with that. (laughs) He actually bought a dinosaur egg. It's crazy. Oh, I heard about him buying a dinosaur skull or something like that. Is a dinosaur skull. I believe he bought a castle as well. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. He's a weird guy. Yeah, yeah. So WB was fully committed and started pre-production in the summer of 1997 with the hope that the film would be released in June of 1998, the 60th anniversary of Superman's first appearance in Action Comics. So right away, Tim Burton was not happy with the script and wanted a rewrite. Given the input from John Peters, this seems understandable. Smith was hoping for a chance to sit down with Burton to discuss the changes, but that didn't happen. Instead, Burton hired screenwriter Wesley Strick to rewrite the script. Strick had worked before with Burton as a script doctor for Batman Returns, so he knew he was capable of creating a better story. After Strick had read the story, he had a few issues, which he stated, quote, First, everywhere Superman went... He was accompanied or shadowed by someone or something called the Eradicator, who seemed to have more lines and more things to do than Superman. (laughs) The villain Brainiac had a comic sidekick called Elron, who similarly took up as much script space as Brainiac and wasn't all that funny. Brainiac's evil plot was to launch a disc into space that would blot out the sun, necessitating the use of his own energy production, a plot device I'd not seen before The Simpsons with Mr. Burns doing (laughs) the Brainiac role. Take one last look at the sun, Springfield. (laughs) Lastly, the script was crammed with so much techno jargon, there were whole pages that were nearly impenetrable. Peters obviously objected to the page one rewrite, but they had to make compromises in order to see the film through, but they were strict on the conditions that Superman had to die. This kind of reminds me of, have you watched Party Down? Yeah. Yeah, they go to Steve Gutenberg's house and they read that script and it's just like so full of techno jargon. Oh, yeah. And then they rewrite the script and make it ultimately better. Like, I feel like that's how kevin smith approached it where he knows so much about the superman lore and every fine detail where if a comic book reader went to the movies they'd be able to pick out every little bit in that movie from the comic books but in actuality this is a movie this is a movie with emotions (laughs) this is a movie with characters that interact with each other and i feel like for Kevin Smith, he may have missed a lot of those cues just because he was so focused on the, the lore of Batman first. Yeah. So I feel like that's kind of the situation going on here. Hmm. Wesley got to work on the new draft. And much like Kevin Smith, he was drawing a lot of inspiration from the World Without Superman collection. Also, to better make sense of the Eradicator character. After that, he decided to do away with the Eradicator, but instead used a sentient robot named K, which was a placeholder name they never got around to changing. So (laughs) (laughs) that would be kind of like Kal-El's Hitchhiker's Guide when navigating the Earth. Earth. Hoppers. And would be the robot that would bring Superman back to life after he was killed. Okay. Strick explained that the changes he made, stating, he did take the pains to characterize Clark or Superman as an alien, painfully conscious of his profoundly outsider status and not always in control of his powers. Think existential scissor hands. 
Plus, after Kay revives Superman in the Fortress of Solitude, Superman returns in a particular Cal L persona, freaking out Lois, Metropolis, and himself before reverting to a more familiar and comfortable Clark Superman schism. Hmm. Tim and I both relish the fact that our hero wasn't simply split down the middle like most Burton heroes, but was for a time a trifurcated personality. And we double the theme by having Brainiac invade the body of Lex Luthor at the story's midpoint, creating an amusing, schizo, scary, mega villain we dubbed Lexiac. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird to see all the art for this and we'll get more into the art later but the way that they combined him was kind of like in harry potter and the philosopher's stone how voldemort merges with one of the um the professor of the against the dark arcs is it quirrell quirrell yeah i only know that because of a harry potter musical where they yeah. make a love story <laughs> between those two and it's the best uh, that's really funny <laughs> <laughs> must agree when you look at you and me we're different different as can arise again and i'll rule the world yeah they kind of merge together like quirrell and voldemort where brainiac is kind of like on the back of lex luther's skull it's weird but kind of awesome <laughs> Tim was so excited about the story that his meeting with Wesley went from his apartment to an office on the WB lot that quickly filled up with sketches and designs for the look of the film. So there was a lot of stuff that needs to be put together, and there is so much that went into the pre-production. But for Kevin Smith and Wesley Strick, they felt like it was time to then bring on a team of production designers and artists to help kind of shape the world. Burton, he hired Rick Henrik as the production designer for Superman Lives. Henrik's has worked with Tim before on his short films like Frank and Weenie and Vincent and nearly every Burton film <laughs> that he's worked on in his career, with the exception of the first Batman. They did bring him on for Batman Returns. Mm. Is that the movie that Tim Burton had the least creative control over? I believe... Well... Yeah, he still had a lot of creative control, but if he couldn't bring on his own production designer, I wonder if that was... Tim Burton wasn't as established as a name, like he definitely was established, but I could definitely see that being the situation where studio wanted to kind of control the project the most. Yeah, and it seemed like a lot of stuff was set up before he came in and started directing. He came in more in the late 80s and WB had obtained the rights to do Batman around the late 70s and early 80s. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things were getting put together at that time. So they were just finding the right director to fit the project, and Tim Burton just happened to be that. And then going on to Batman Returns, for Tim, he felt like that was his better film. And a lot of the mistakes that he had made in the first Batman, he felt like he could make up for in the second Batman. He was definitely getting the experience in, in knowing how uh, even a superhero movie should be put together. Makes sense as to why they would bring him on. But now that he's got two Batman films under his belt, he can pretty much ask for whatever he wants because he knows for WB, they know whatever he puts together, it's going to work. Yeah. But yeah, he did hire on Rick Henrik. So at this time, he had just finished working for The Big Lebowski. He also brought in a bunch of other team members as well. This is quite the list here, put into context, like what other things they've worked on. So they brought on John Dexter, who was part of Mars Attacks, Jackie's Ray, who worked on Hook, Batman Returns, Casper, Judge Dredd, Seven, Jumanji, Independence Day, Mars Attacks, and The Fifth Element. Now, I do want to preface this just because if you start looking up these people's IMDb profiles right now, whenever I list any of these people's movies that they've been a part of, I will only include movies that they've been in previously Yeah, okay. leading up to this. Unless they haven't really done much or this was one of their first jobs, then I will actually 
say what they've been in the future. So if you actually start looking these people up in their IMDb, you'll notice like a lot of them have so many projects under their belt and I'm only listing the ones before them. But you want to look at this from the lens of like the same way yes. the studio would be looking at the, the same information that they had when, or that Tim Burton had when choosing this yes, team. Yes, exactly. There was Harold Beckler. This was his first project. After this, he immediately went on to Batman and Robin. There was <laughs> Jack Johnson, who had worked on The Shadow, The Goonies, Short Circuit, Beetlejuice, Ghostbusters 2, Edward Scissorhands, and Independence Day prior. There was James Carson, who had worked on Ed Wood, Batman Forever, The Rock, Mars Attacks. So it seems like it's really um, Burton heavy there. Oh, for sure. There's Bill Bowes, who worked on The Nightmare Before Christmas, Alien Resurrection, James and the Giant Peach, and the TV show Kablam! from uh, the 90s. <laughs> that was such a weird variety show, but I really liked it. I don't know if I know anything about Kablam. Because growing up, I wasn't too much of a Disney child, but I did have cable, so a lot of me growing up was watching Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network. Actually, Cartoon Network had just began when I was like in first or second grade, I believe, is when it first started. So I was there like right from the beginning, and I remember my dad showing me, and he's like, it's a whole network, like a whole channel just dedicated to cartoons, and I was just in love with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Last person on the team they brought on was... Sylvian Depreets, who worked on Don't Tell Mom, The Babysitter's Dead, Universal Soldier, The City of Lost Children, The Fifth Element, and Alien Resurrection. So I, I'm seeing quite the pattern here. So you're getting like a good mix of people that have worked with Tim Burton and understand his style. You have a lot of people who come from having that superhero background and you have a lot of people who are working with like we got two people who worked on alien resurrection so having that idea of like odd creatures and introducing that it feels like you basically set up the perfect team to really create and shape the look of this superman movie so it's interesting if you get a chance to look up a lot of their art for superman lives and you could just spend days just pouring over the stuff that they created. It's pretty amazing. The team, they were eager to put something together. The problem was is that they were expecting a script from Wesley Strict. The problem was is that he wasn't ready to give it to them because he had a lot of conflicts with John Peters. He wasn't ready for them to, to get it. Although they were given a copy of Kevin Smith's script, but they were told not to read it because that is not the script that they're going <laughs> off of. But hey, we really need a script to be able to work on this. Well, we don't have a script for you yet. Okay, well, we do have this old script. So we'll give this to you since <laughs> you're asking for a script, but don't actually read it or do anything with it. Real helpful studio. And now they're just sitting in there all day and be like, should we, I guess we could just draw it. Superman. <laughs> so the team had tried putting together some concept, like Superman's costume. They started to draw what a real life black Superman outfit would look like. And they were also trying to mess around with Superman's original costume, the red and blue suit, but they were trying to figure out how they can make that suit, but lose the iconic red underwear, which at this point, Superman was kind of getting mocked for. Yeah. And we even start seeing it when a superhero is parodied or portrayed in other mediums. So, like, when you look at the show Doug, and when he's Quail Man, he has, like, those whitey tighties on the outside, and that wouldn't be there if it wasn't for a superhero like Superman. Yeah. Like I mentioned before, the person that was really standing in the way of Wesley Strick giving them a script was not Tim Burton, but it was John Peters. Now, according to Strict, John Peters was in constant contact with toy companies whose deals would help offset the picture's huge expense. I mean, that makes sense that they would do that. He would occasionally call me to demand that Superman use some sort of jetpack when he'd <laughs> temporarily lose his flying abilities, or Brainiac would float above the Earth in this skull ship, which he'd reach via a shuttle, which must have like a particular design. So the idea is like you want to create an action figure, a 
playset for the action figure and then all the accessories that go on with it. I mean, we've seen uh, Barbie and G.I. Joe and kind of how that works. And that's essentially what they're trying to do again. Bilbo's was the one in charge of making the skull ship and the prototype to this. You can actually look it up online, uh, the actual prototype. It's amazing. So the idea was that Brainiac would travel around in the skull ship. The opening where the eyes were, that was kind of like the windshield where he would look out of into space as they traveled around. For the prototype, Bose, he actually took a skull sculpture and then he added some engravings to the surface of the sculpture kind of it kind of loosely looked like uh, one of those sugar skulls except it wasn't colorful (laughs) in any way you'll have to look it up it's pretty amazing and then he took bits and pieces of a model train from a model train store which i think i know where that is (laughs) because i live in burbank like right next to wb like they're practically my neighbor And just down the road from me is an actual model train shop. That's the only thing that they sell is model trains and accessories. (laughs) And I want to believe that it came from that shop. I mean, it would make sense. Mm -hmm. So he was taking like bits and pieces there. He would glue them to the outside of the skull just to show the mechanisms that were controlling and powering the ship. The plan to build this massive ship would have actually been done on stage 16. I don't know if you know much about stage 16 or the Warner Brothers lot, but stage 16 is the biggest soundstage that they have on the lot. Ooh, there, there was a story as to like why it was so big. It was because of a Busby Berkeley musical. And if you've ever seen any of those, like it's a huge spectacle. And Marion Davies was the star of this movie and there was one shot in particular it was like this overhead shot that they could not get because the soundstage was not big enough and marion davies wanted this stage to be much bigger and taller uh, in order for this to happen and she actually asked her i guess boyfriend (laughs) is what (laughs) we should call him but her boyfriend was william randolph hearse Mm. And he actually supplied the money to make this <laughs> soundstage so big. They actually lifted it up from the ground up. Oh, my gosh. And made it taller for this. But they've shot scenes from Jurassic Park in there. They have a huge water tank in there as well. So they filmed, like, Poseidon in there. They filmed The Perfect Storm in there. So a lot of, like, these big water scenes are done in there just because of that water tank area, like, This is a massive, massive (laughs) stage. And for them to actually build the spaceship in there only means like it would have been incredibly huge. Inside of that spacecraft was a menagerie of all sorts of aliens that Brainiac had collected while he had visited different planets. And that would have been amazing. And like I mentioned before, when you can look up a lot of the concept art, you can actually see just a whole plethora of aliens that were created for this menagerie. So if you're telling these artists, hey, make up an alien, like you can imagine the uh, wild stuff, especially (laughs) people who have worked for Tim Burton and know his style, you know they would have made some really interesting and creepy things. In the MCU, we've got the Collector and uh, that whole thing on, on Nowhere and Guardians of the Galaxy, which I feel like is a similar idea. And those scenes are chock full of weird easter eggs to comic book things and to other things in the movies it's kind of weird because like i feel like those scenes you only see a couple of things in jars and there's like a couple of cool things to spot but i'm really imagining that sort of look but like really amped up just brimming with detail hmm. now do you think that brainiac would have a blue never nude <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so, too. (laughs) And that'll conclude part one of Superman Lives. Stay tuned next week to see if this movie actually got made. Well, it didn't. I mean, if it did, this episode wouldn't be happening. It didn't get made. But stay tuned next week to see what happens to Superman Lives. If you want to send us any emails about any movies that you want us to cover 
or have any corrections because we will make mistakes. I know we do. Uh, <laughs> you can send that to not get made at gmail.com we are on instagram at how did this not get made and we are on twitter at hdtngm yes what david said (laughs) (laughs) thanks again everybody for listening thank you 